Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video and today's topic is the white witch was a Nephilim hybrid. The current read aloud in our homeschool is C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. We finished The Magician's Nephew several months ago, kind of took a break from the series and are back with this book. And this is the second time that I'm reading this aloud, but the first time I read it aloud was probably about eight years ago. So it was to a different set of children. And I'm seeing this book in an entirely different light because of all the research that I have done since the original time I read it. And so I just wanted to share some really interesting stuff with you today. Now this first one, I'm not going to get into too much, but I just wanted to share it with you because it reminds me of understanding conspiracies theory on the Nephilim looking like clowns. And so this is from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and it says her face, and it's referring to the white, to the white witch. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. And so as I read that, I thought, oh, she sounds like a clown. Well, that certainly would fit it right in with the, the clown theory. So, yeah. And, you know, we have to remember that. I mentioned this in several videos. Now, C.S. Lewis was, well, we'll say at least suspected to be an adept. He was a member of the Inkling Society along with Tolkien. And they they both were privy to some esoteric knowledge that, you had to be in a certain, we'll say, family line in order to get into this Inkling Society. So they were given information that we were not. And whether the whether Lewis and Tolkien became a Christian and a Catholic um, after they were in the Inkling Society, we're not really sure. But, you know, my thought is that if C.S. Lewis would have become a believer after learning all of this esoteric occultic knowledge he may have been trying to show it to us the reader through his books in a form of legomanism maybe even using legomanism which was which is really used a lot by the adepts um, using it kind of against them that's my theory at least that's what i hope i try to give him the benefit of the doubt i know that a lot of people are very suspicious of him c.s lewis i mean anyway but the main one, whoops, wrong way. The main one that I wanted to share with you today was this. So this is also from, from the book. And I'm just going to read all of it to you at first. And then I'm just going to go through it a little bit at a time. Because just in this little bit, there is so much information packed in here. And I have so many theories on this. So when Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. So things must be drawing near their end now. He's come and you've come. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before, long ago. Nobody can say when, but there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver, and it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen. But she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's. Here, Mr. Beaver bowed. Your father Adam's first wife, her they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side. And on the other, she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. Okay, so now that I've read the entire passage to you, let's just go back and just kind of go through it piece by piece. And I might have to go back and forth a little bit for things to come together but hopefully everything will kind of mesh well after I'm finished. So it starts with when Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. To me, what this is rem reminiscent of is that 
God gave man dominion over the earth, which is why there needed to be sons of Adam sitting on the thrones in Care Paravel, because this is an allegory. So this is kind of um, a parallel between earth and Narnia. And just as God gave man dominion on earth in this book, he also gave the son of Adam, a.k.a. man, dominion in Care Paravel. And one day, you know, we will, believers, will be ruling, reigning with Christ on the throne. We'll just continue on here. So things must be drawing near their end now. He's come and you've come. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before, long ago. Nobody can say when but there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver. And why would she like them to believe it? She would like them to believe it because she wanted to have the right to the throne that the son of Adam ha had. And that is exactly what the watchers wanted a lot of times we we kind of make the assumption that the reason that the watchers wanted to come in in with the women was because they were able to reproduce with them and that is something that the angels in heaven do not do and that's certainly part of it but the reason that they wanted to have these children with these human women was because they, they, the watchers, would get their seed into human women. And by default, the, since the, they had human mothers, they would be able to reign on the thrones. And if we look even throughout the Bible, there are many Nephilim giants. King Og is just one example. And this is something that is still prevalent through royal bloodlines today there is still nephilim bloodline running through all of the monarchies that are still in place today and i'm going to say in much of the leadership throughout the world now they're obviously not physical giants anymore but this is one of the reasons that the watchers did what they did they wanted to usurp that dominion that God gave to man and they did this by creating their own form of hybrid that still had the DNA of men in them via their mothers. I'm going to start here. And it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen. See, she's pretending to be human. So she is basing her claim on that fact. But she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's, here Mr. Beaver bowed, your father Adam's first wife, her they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other side she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. So here we're told that the white witch comes from Lilith, and the white witch is a jinn, and on the other side she comes from giants. So firstly, I just wanted I found something interesting that that was about C.S. Lewis's book that I wanted to share with you. It says, like the green lady, the witch's origins are vague, but Lewis suggests that she is of Adam's first wife, Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side. And on the other, she comes of the giants. Lewis had a lifelong fascination with the possibility of quasi-human mythic creatures. He writes to Sister Penelope, I have, if not thought, yet imagined a good deal about the other kinds of men. My own idea was based on the old problem. Who was Cain's wife? If we follow scripture, it would seem that she must have been no daughter of Adam's. I pictured the true men descending from Seth, then meeting Cain's not perfectly human descendants, interbreeding and thus producing the wicked antediluvians. So what we, what we can ascertain from what we just read from Lewis's own mouth, or Lewis's own writings at least, 
it wasn't just that dominion was given to humans in Narnia. Dominion was given to the sons of Adam with the suggestion that there were other beings that looked like humans that were not the sons of Adam. And that's why the terms sons of Adam and daughters of Eve are so important because it is their bloodline that dominion was given to. And again, it makes me think of the possibility of the the people of day six. There is a theory that there were two time, two separate times that people were created at the end of chapter one in Genesis. And then also at the beginning of chapter two. Now, again, there, there were no chapters in the original writing, but there does seem to give two to two separate creation accounts. And many people believe that there were separate people created before Adam was created. And in fact, something that's very interesting is that in the Genesis 6 conspiracy, Gary Wayne alludes to the idea that the Watchers, they procreated with the day six women, not the women from the line of Adam. And that is who then Cain married would have been someone from the day six creation. But that is also who these Watchers procreated with. And in, in a parallel account, L.A. Marzulli says that um, it is just certain types of people that are um, abducted by aliens. And it just makes you wonder if there is some sort of a link between the two. And, you know, that's not something that I've really thought of much, but it's just interesting that Gary Wayne has this idea that the, the Watchers procreated with just a certain group of women and then it seems that ufo abductees at least according to la marzulli are it is they are also from like a particular group and again i i don't know i haven't really looked into it and i don't really follow the alien abduction stuff much anymore i used to think it was really interesting but that was back when i thought space was real <laughs> so i don't really follow that stuff much anymore so since what this tells us is that the white witch was a daughter of Lilith. Let's read a little bit about Lilith. And I'm actually going to start, I have an article pulled up, but I'm just going to share with you what Gary Wayne has to say about her because it's very interesting. He says, hmm, where do I want to start? Who is Lilith and where did she come from? Theosophists have substituted Eve for Lilith in their bent genealogy. In the same figurative sense, Lilith was in truth the original goddess Ninkorsog, Gaia, Isis of the Cainites, that produced the first race of antediluvian giants. So yes, that is actually another theory or another legend is that Lilith produced the first race of giants just going to continue continue it just says remember in this dimension angels can choose their gender and produce other gods so that is where where i tend to differ from what these or, original legends said of lilith they, they say that she was the original wife of adam or the first wife of adam and like gary wayne i believe that she was actually one of the original watchers and that she was the one that came down and um procreated with well whatever she could and it tells us again that remember in this dimension angels can choose their gender and produce other gods so let's co go over here though and read a little bit about lilith lilith a female demon assigned a central position in jewish demonology she appears briefly in the sumerian gilgamesh epic and is found in Babylonian demonology, which identifies similar male and female spirits, Lilu and Lilitu respectively, which are etymolo etymologically unrelated to the Hebrew word Layla. So let me see. I'm not going to read this whole article. In scripture, there is only one reference to Lilith in Isaiah 34, 14, among the beasts of prey and the spirits that will lay waste the land on the day of vengeance. 
In sources dating from earlier centuries, traditions concerning the female demon who endanger, endangers women in childbirth and who assumes many guises and names are distinct from the explicit tradition on Lilith recorded in the Talmud. Now, one thing that I also want to say is that in the Genesis, the Genesis 6 conspiracy, Gary Wayne also speaks of the fact that Lilith is associated with vampires. From these ancient traditions, the image of Lilith was fixed in Kabbalistic demonology. Now, just I just have to say at this point, how many people at the time that C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, how many people at that time knew even knew about this sort of thing, about Jinn, about Lilith? I'm not sure. You know, on one hand, on the one hand, people of earlier times were more in tune with that sort of thing. But also you have to remember that fairies and elves and all of these sort of what we might call supernatural entities were, were kind of shunned when the evolutionary theory came and when this enlightenment phase came. So they, they kind of pushed all that stuff away. And so I am wondering to myself, you know, why was it so important that he include this in his book, especially if he was writing to an audience that may not have had any idea of the significance of these beings that he's writing about? And even I, the first time that I read it, it, it didn't click with me. I just thought, oh, that's neat and didn't think about it again. But now is when I'm really looking deeper into it and I'm like, wow, there is really an underlying story in here. So it says here too, she has two primary roles the strangler of children and the seducer of men from whose nocturnal emission she bears an infinite number of demonic sons. In this latter role, she appears at the head of a vast host who share in her activities. Belief in her erotic powers led some Jewish communities to adopt the custom of sons not accompanying their dead father's body to the cemetery because they would be shamed by the hovering presence of their demon step siblings born of their father's seduction by Lilith. In the Zohar, as in other sources, she is known by such appellations as Lilith, the harlot, the wicked, the false, or the black. She is generally numbered among the four mothers of the demons, the others being Agrot, Mahalath, and Nema. Wholly new in the Kabbalistic concept of Lil Lilith is her appearance as the permanent partner of Samael, queen of the realm of the forces of evil. In that world, she fulfills a function parallel to that of the Shekinah in the world of sanctity. Just as the Shekinah is the mother of the house of Israel, so Lilith is the mother of the unholy folk who constituted the mixed multitude and ruled over all that is impure. I'm just going to go down here a little bit. Widespread, too, is the identification of Lilith with the Queen of Sheba a notion with many ramifications in Jewish folklore. It originates in the Targum to Job 115 based on a Jewish and Arab myth that the Queen of Sheba was actually a jinn, half human and half demon. This view was known to Moses, B. Shem Tov de Leon, and is also mentioned in the Zohar. In Livnat Bas Sapir, Joseph Angelino ma maintains that the riddles which the Queen of Sheba posed to Solomon are a repetition of the words of seduction which the first Lilith spoke to Adam. And, you know, I'm just going to say right here, we need to take this for what it is. This is just literature. This is just legend. And a lot of this is stuff that we need to just take with a grain of salt. It's something that I find interesting. It's not something that I actually believe. Okay. We need to remember that this is one of those things where there is some truth in these legends, but it's not something that I am going to take, you know, like it's canon. Absolutely not. You have to be very, very careful with anything that has to do with Kabbalistic um, legends or tales. So, as a child of Lilith, the white witch was considered to be one of the jinn, which is something that is um, very popular in, I believe it's in the Quran and also in Jewish legend as well. Excuse me, I just went to check because I wasn't sure about that. The jinn actually are, they are Islamic, 
but there is something very similar in Hebrew literature called the Shadim. And yeah, there, there are some parallels between the Shadim and the Jinn. Besides being a Jinn and the daughter of Lilith, the, the White Witch is also part giant. So being the child of something that was part Lilith, who very likely may have been a watcher and was herself a djinn and was also part giant. And remember what we talked about, or at least what I talked about, where it's, it's a theory that the watchers only procreated with the, the women of day six and specifically the people who were given dominion over Narnia were only in the line of Adam and in the line of Eve. So even though a giant is typically born of a human mother and a watcher father, it doesn't mean that he had any blood at all from, from Adam in him because he was likely born of a woman of day six. And that's where it says, uh, no, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. So that actually goes back to a question that I answered the other day about if the Nephilim were really bad. And it is thought if you read the book of Giants, if you read the book of Enoch, and yes, you, the, the Nephilim, they were a major cause of the biblical flood. So yes, they were evil. And it tells us here. That's why she's bad all through Mr. Beaver, because they were actually a creation of the watchers to steal the dominion of the earth. Now we're going, we're talking about the earth now, not, not Narnia here. They were, they were created to steal the dominion. So yes, they are going to try to rule over those that they are stealing the dominion from. True enough, Mrs. Beaver replied he, there may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. So the whole idea of here, it's talking about a daughter of Eve and throughout the book, the Chronicles of Narnia, it, it calls the children, the sons of Adam. And I had never really made that distinction that many of these, what we might call elves, fairies, goblins may have been some sort of Nephilim hybrid creation stemming from the people of day six, if the people of day six actually existed. This is all in theory. But this brings to mind something else that I read. I read too much, I guess. In the book, Little Creatures by Steve Quayle, there's a part about a footnote that was in a book on geology published by the Royal Physical Society of Edinburgh in the mid 1800s. And this was by paleontologist Hugh Miller. And so this is just a part of it. I'm not reading the whole thing, but this is a story of some sort of elven creatures that were seen. And this is an actual account. Again, this was a footnote in a book on geology. So this is, this wasn't, you know, just some book on fairy tales. There's no anthology of folk tales. This was a nonfiction book. It says, on a Sabbath morning, nearly 60 years ago, the inmates of this little hamlet had all gone to church, all except a herd boy and a little girl, his sister, who were lounging beside one of the cottages. When just as the shadow of the garden dial had fallen on the line of noon, they saw a long cavalcade ascending out of the ravine through the wooded hollow. It winded among the knolls and bushes, and turning round the northern gable of the cottage beside which the sole spectators of the scene were stationed, began to ascend the eminence towards the south. The horses were shaggy, diminutive things, speckled, dun, and gray. The riders, stunted, misgrown, ugly creatures, attired in antique jerkins of plaid, long gray cloaks and little red caps from under which their wild uncombed locks shot out over their cheeks and forehead. The boy and his sister stood gazing in utter dismay and astonishment as rider after rider, each one more uncouth and dwarfish than the one that had preceded it, passed the cottage and disappeared among the brushwood which at that period covered the hill, until at length the entire route, except the last rider, 
who lingered a few yards behind the others, had gone by. "'What are ye, little man, and where are ye going?' inquired the boy, his curiosity getting the better of his fears and his prudence. "'Not of the race of Adam,' said the creature, turning for a moment in his saddle. "'The people of peace shall never more be seen in Scotland.' So as this little boy called him a little man, he asked him where he was going. And the first thing that he, that he decided to say was he decided to turn around and tell the little boy that he is not of the race of Adam. And I just find that very interesting with respect to how many times, you know, son of Adam is used in the Chronicles of Narnia. And knowing that C.S. Lewis was privy to so much information that we don't know, I can only just imagine what sorts of things he was putting inside of this book that's a this seemingly fictional book but how many nuggets of truth were actually in here that's all that i have for you today if you like this video give it a thumbs up if you haven't subscribed and would like to hear more of what i have to say i would love if you would do that if you have any questions or comments you can leave one either here or over on instagram and if you like my work and would like to check out my YouTube membership page. I almost forgot. I will leave a link in the description box for that as well, or you can just click on it in my, on my homepage. And I hope you have a great day.